let's dive, dive straight in. What's the first tip you've got for us today? First tip is that I think teachers should learn about reading development. Now, everyone is a teacher of literacy to some extent. We have a shared responsibility across the profession for making sure that pupils become confident, capable readers. And it means that I think it's incredibly valuable that all teachers develop some understanding of what reading is and how people learn to do it. Now, the easiest thing for me to do here would be to say, okay, that's the tip, now go read my book. But I, re <laughs> I understand that lots of people, if not the majority, won't have the time or the inclination to read a whole book about reading. So with your permission, what I'd like to try and do is to sum up what reading is and how we do it um, for your listeners in, I don't know, five or six minutes? Oh, is that okay? ideal. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a bit beyond me, but I'm going to give it a go. So I think a good place to start is with spoken language. When uh, you are trying to understand what someone is saying and you're working out what's, what's going on with their words, you are comprehending their language. And what we mean by that is we are not remembering the exact words they say. You are building a mental model of, um, that relates to the thing they're talking about. So in short, you're building meaning from their words. And this relies on certain knowledge, knowledge of the words themselves, the re real world concepts that the words refer to, and it also relies on your knowledge of how those words interact. Now we learn this stuff fairly naturally. It's something we've evolved to do because spoken language is at least kind of tens of thousands of years old. And we do this thing when we're reading. This is one competency that um, we need to develop in order to be able to read. Language comprehension, building meaning from words. But there is a second competency that we need to develop when we're reading, and that is the ability to recognize words on a page. Now, this is the case because, of course, written language doesn't work directly with spoken sounds. It works through representing words using squiggles on a page. So in order to recognize words on a page, we need to become experts in dealing with our writing system. So if we want to know how reading develops, we need to know a bit about um, our writing system. So I'm going to explain a little bit about it now. Because we are trying to represent spoken language in squiggles on a page, what we do in English is we try and take some of those sounds and encode them. We try and pick a, a set of symbols and represent some sounds. Now, there are different choices that we could have made with our writing system for kind of what size chunk of sounds to deal with. But the size chunk of sound that we deal with in our writing system is something called the phoneme. We can think of it as the, the atom of our spoken language. They're the smallest chunks of sounds that we can categorize in spoken language. So for example, in the word shop, we can break that down into these atoms of spoken sound, sh, o, p. And um, we can tell that they're phonemes because I can't take sh and break it down any further. I can't break that into two separate sounds. So at heart, our writing system takes this size chunk of sound and tries to represent it in symbols. Other languages use different size chunks of sound. So Japanese represents syllables, for example. That doesn't work in English. We represent um, phonemes. So in English, we will use um, the letters of an alphabet, either individual letters or small groups of letters to represent individual phonemes. And when we do that, we call that individual letter or set of letters a grapheme. There are relationships between the phonemes and graphemes in our writing system. The uh, relationships in, in effect between the sounds and the letters we use to spell them. So if we're going to recognize a word on a page like shop, we um, have to identify the, the phonemes. So sh, o, p. But we then also need to be able to blend them together because sh, o, p isn't a word. Shop is a word. So in short, for us to recognize words, we need to be able to know the relevant correspondence between sounds and spellings, between phonemes and graphemes, and we also need to be able to use it. Now, that would be a relatively easy thing to learn if there were a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between graphemes and phonemes, as there are in many languages. So in, say, Estonian or Finnish or Welsh, there is close to a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symbols and the sounds. So this means that as soon as you know how the word sounds, you can spell it and you know you're going to be right. 
But in English, that's not the case. I mentioned the sh phoneme earlier. Well, we can represent that with the, the grapheme sh in words like shop, but we can also represent it with the uh, grapheme ch in words like mm. chef and with other um, graphemes as well. So there is this complexity in our writing system. And we, call, we can think of our writing system as this code of correspondences between graphemes and phonemes, and it's a complex code. Now, the reason for this complexity is because English uh, written language is, is really old. And our pronunciations have evolved over time. It's been built around lots of different languages that have been uh, used as um, people, have come into, uh, people have come into England. So it's really complex. But the other reason why it's complex is because there are chunks of meaning that are spelt consistently in our language. So take the word walked and the word hinted. Both of them have this ED bit on the end that shows that we're talking about the past. And it's spelt the same way in both words, which is useful, but they represent different sounds. We say hinted, we don't say walked. So this is the reason why we have this complexity in our writing code, because there's um, meaning that's encoded in there as well and because of the history of our words. But in short, if we are going to recognize words, we need to become experts in this writing code that's based around the phoneme and we need to become experts in using this code as well. So that's how we recognize words when we can use that code and when we know about that code but we also have this other competency that I mentioned at the start which is building meaning from those words. When we can recognize words and build meaning from words then we can read and that's kind of the short and long of it. Just one, a couple, a couple of nuances to add there. I've talked about these um, competencies as if they're entirely separate. I've said we've got word recognition and language comprehension. The reality is that they become increasingly integrated as we learn to read, which is the reason why when you read something, it won't feel like you are recognizing the words and then building meaning. You will feel like you're doing it all at the same time because these two competencies, as we become expert, become increasingly integrated or interwoven. And the very last thing I'll say then is, OK, if there are these two competencies, how do we teach them? The short version of that is that um, explicit instruction for both of them is really useful and vast experience of using them is essential. So in the case of word recognition, I've talked about that code of correspondences between phonemes and graphemes, between sounds and letters. If we teach some of that code explicitly and say, look, this, um, this letter can represent this sound. If we teach that explicitly and we teach children explicitly how to use that code, that's called phonics. That's all phonics is. It's just teaching some of that stuff that's in our language explicitly. But we also need loads of experience of then putting that into practice to learn the majority of the code. Phonics isn't going to teach children every single aspect of the code and where it's going to be applied necessarily. Um, experience with text, experience decoding at first supervised and then eventually independently gives people that experience, that pattern spotting so they learn the code. So a mixture of explicit instruction and vast experience. The same is true for the other competency, for language comprehension. We as I said, we learn that quite naturally when we're exposed to a language rich environment. But we can also teach parts of it explicitly. I can teach vocabulary explicitly. I can teach a curriculum so that children know lots about the world to help them comprehend what they read. I can also teach children what to expect from different kinds of texts. In summary, there are these two competencies, word recognition and language comprehension. And if we develop both of these, then we can become an expert reader. <sighs> flipping out. I could listen to you all day um, about this. I, I genuinely could. I find it a fascinating area that I'm ignorant of completely. Just a couple of follow-up questions on this, Chris. First is, from my reading of, of Twitter, and it's always a dangerous thing to, to, to do, I get the sense that there's a big controversy here, particularly around phonics. Loads of people are slagging off phonics left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. Loads of people seem to be big advocates. Could you just summarise for someone as ignorant as me, what's the debate there? Um... Well, it's very difficult to summarise, but at heart, um, there is a lot of misunderstanding in this debate because the word phonics is used to describe lots of different things. So we can teach phonics in different ways. And one of the ways to teach phonics is called systematic synthetic phonics. That's where we teach the code and how to use it 
the systematic part means we plan it out and we organize it step by step um, and we make sure that it kind of gr is incremental. So we start with the easiest bits to learn, the most common bits in our language, and we build up stage by stage. That's what the systematic bit means. The synthetic bit means that we teach those correspondences from the very beginning. We don't teach children to memorize loads of words and then go, OK, now you know these words you can recognize some correspondences within them. From the very beginning, we're saying, this word is tip, tip, tip. From the very beginning, we're teaching these correspondences. Now, there is a really good body of evidence to suggest that um, the, the best way to teach word recognition is through systematic phonics. And there's a suggestive amount of evidence to suggest that doing that in a synthetic way, so teaching these correspondences from the very beginning, is, is more effective. It isn't absolutely overwhelming at this point, but phonics, but teaching phonics in a systematic way has a massive body of evidence for its efficacy. Where the controversy comes is that um, people have tend to portray phonics as a way of teaching reading. And if you think about what I've just described, it's a way of getting children started with the process of word recognition which contributes to reading. And so if you think that phonics is the way that reading is taught, you will assume that that completely ignores all of the other stuff. So in reception, where systematic synthetic phonics is taught, alongside that, we are developing pupils' ability to comprehend words in, in speech, their, their ability to speak. Um, we read um, wonderful stories and picture books to develop their understanding of the world. There are all of these other bits and pieces that come along with phonics. But if you have in your mind the idea that phonics is teaching reading and effectively that's all we're doing, or that that is meaning that other aspects are being deprioritized, then you can understand where the uh, controversy might arise. Excellent. Got it. And just two final follow-up questions from me, Chris, on this. So <coughs> the first is, I'm, I'm the father of a three-year-old, and I'm, I'm panicking, Chris, straight away, right? Because you often hear, as a maths teacher, I often hear parents say, or oh, maths isn't taught like it used to be when I was at school. I don't know what's going on with this. For me as a parent now, I'm thinking, I, I don't have a clue how reading's taught at all. And I'm trying to do the best. Like, we, we always read books, me and Isaac. But I'm thinking, should I be sounding out these words now? And he, I'll tell you what, he specialises at recognising his name. He can find his name in, in anywhere. Mm -hmm. But in terms of kind of recognising the word cow or something, it's like he's never seen it before in his life, even though most stories involve a cow at some point. So for, for a parent like me of a three-year-old, and even for parents listening for slightly older students who aren't as familiar with, obviously, the technicalities of this, what, what's the best thing parents can be doing? I would say the best thing that parents could be doing is, um, well, obviously engaging with reading like you're doing already. But I would say that once children begin the process of word recognition <clears throat> through the identification of phonemes in words, I would start by encouraging that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your school will, um, or your child's school, will almost certainly send home books that give them the opportunity to practice the grapheme phoneme correspondences that they'll be learning while they're uh, in, in school. That will be a really important thing for you to practice with them. So at first, when children are learning the most basic sound spelling correspondences, they might only have, that the books that they bring home might only contain words like um, tip and top and pit and pat and this sort of thing. And children, you'll be encouraging your child to identify the sounds that are being represented. So t, ip, tip, and you'll be encouraging them over time to do that for every word that they encounter. So um, identifying sounds within words is a really valuable thing to do, in particular trying to identify these smallest chunks of sound, which will be easier when you see these um, decodable books, is, is the key thing to allow them to kind of get started. I don't think that there's no harm whatsoever in enjoying texts at the moment, but when they begin to do that, make sure there's lots of practice so that they embed as the go-to method for, for recognizing words, identifying the phonemes within words and then blending them together. Fantastic. And final question, and I always like to try and play devil's advocate um, when I interview. So this is my horrible question to ask Chris. So as a secondary maths teacher, do I need to know all this or can I just kind of cross my fingers and hope it's all been sorted by the time they arrive in September year seven? It's a really good question because I know it's pie in the sky to say, oh, OK, maths teachers, I want you to teach reading as well as teaching, you know, algebra and SIRDs and all, and all that kind of stuff. 
that said, we by having a better understanding of reading, we are relatively able to identify where pupils are struggling with reading. We're better able to support them when we uh, ask them, when we, if we want them to spell a word, when we want to introduce a bit of vocabulary, by understanding um, how our writing system works at least a little bit, we're able to teach them this in a way that builds on what they've already learned rather than just by saying, this is a word, I want you to know it. Equally, I would add, my partner's a secondary maths teacher, but she's also a form tutor, and she says she's benefited massively from being able to hear children read and start to recognise what the individual issues that they might have relating to reading are through a better understanding of how our writing system works and how reading happens. And I dare say that might relate to another tip I will describe later. Fantastic, and I love nothing more than a teaser as well, because that's brilliant. <laughs>